from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Heading into the second half of last year, some investors felt that the semiconductor run-up last summer was a harbinger for a broader tech rally. And that thesis proved prescient and rewarded managers who took on risk at that time with leading firms in semiconductor security and enterprise software. And the question is, of course, where do we go from, from here? Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we welcome back Ivana Delevska, the founder and chief investment officer at Spear Invest, NASDAQ SPRX. Ivana, great to see you again. Thanks for taking some time. Thanks for having me, Dave. Yeah, you bet. Last time we had you on was August of 2023. And, you know, my bad. I apologize that it took so long to, to have you back. But at that time, I asked you about NVIDIA, and you were very strong in your conviction that we're heading into what I'll call a data center spending super cycle. And rather than read this, let's listen to what you said at the time. Please, Alex, play the clip. Well, David, we still, we'll st we still love NVIDIA going into the next cycle. We believe we're in the early innings of data center spending. So you're just starting to see companies like Microsoft, Meta, Google, expand their CapEx budgets going into going into next year. So we believe NVIDIA is going to benefit from that. They're unique. Now, now, Ivana, that was pretty forward thinking. And well, it's certainly not dollar for dollar. Last quarter, NVIDIA's revenue equated to about half of the CapEx spend from the big three hyperscalers. So there's some kind of correlation there. And that premise combined with what we said at the top really paid off for your fund. You made the previous statement back in August, and you can see here your fund performance relative to the uh, S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. You told us at the time you were fully invested and were pretty risk on setting up for a good run in the second half and obviously into 2024, you were right on. And the NVIDIA trade, of course, has powered a number of high flying companies beyond the MAG-7. So the question is now what? How are you thinking about the market going forward, the cloud and the hyperscalers are loading up on GPUs, as is Meta, to train Llama 2 and Llama 3. Kathy Wood trimmed her NVIDIA holdings in 2023 and missed the recent move, and other investors are starting to show some concerns about the inflated nature of NVIDIA's stock and maybe overbuying of GPUs, although I saw Piper today upped its target price on NVIDIA. You've done very well with the stock. What are your thoughts going forward? Are you taking some profits, the profits you're holding firm, looking to buy pullbacks, what's your thinking? Well, Dave, we believe we're still in the early innings of this tech cycle and we're ju we just scratched the surface of the GPU opportunity. So we still see mm -hmm. a lot more upside than several years actually of upside here. If you look at the earnings estimates for NVIDIA, while they've increased for the current year, if you look out to 2025, six and seven, the street is assuming less than 20% CAGR in the earnings for data for the data center segment versus the prior cycle we saw over 40% CAGR for data center. So we still think that the street is underestimating the earnings potential. If you look at the valuation, it actually screens quite reasonable. Nvidia is trading close to the middle to the bottom of the EV to EBDA range on a one year forward basis. So this is really what we follow closely to assess whether we are at the peak of the cycle or we are in the middle of the cycle. And right now it seems more like we're closer to the middle or the beginning rather than the peak. And you know, I tend to agree with that. I mean, if you think about the hyperscalers and they're flush with cash and they're investing all this money in, in to, to get these GPUs, we have a new you know, set of GPUs coming out, the H200s. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that, that investment, that CapEx really doesn't hit the income statement. I mean, it may be partial for the depreciation of those assets, but what else are these hyperscalers going to do with their cash? They might as well load up on GPUs. And where else are they going to go for GPUs? I mean, yeah, maybe a little bit of AMD, maybe Intel will have something, but NVIDIA has got by far the, the strongest play. Uh, do you agree with that? That's right. I think you're spot on. And the, if you even listen to how they're talking about building out these GPU clusters, it's not necessarily a one-time investment. This is an ongoing investment that will be needed by the hyperscalers and enterprises. So the large ones have really already uh, gotten a head start, like Meta is one of the ones that's the most 
heavily invested in GPUs, but they, there was just a blog post the other day about the new cluster that they're building. And it, it's it, you can, just by reading that, you can see that this is not a one-time investment. It's something that will be ongoing as new models come to market and as inference and applications come to market. So I think back to my prior point, you really are seeing how this is just the beginning. Yeah, these cluster clustering architectures are back. And, and the other thing, you know, Jensen said in the call last quarter was that 40%, and he said that might be even conservative, 40% of their deployments were for inference. And then one of the Wall Street analysts I thought asked a really good question. He said, Do, is, is it right to assume that today's training GPUs will become tomorrow's inference GPUs? The importance of that being there'll be a depreciated asset and essentially be a free for these data center managers to just deploy at inference. And how, how do you think about that? What were your, your thoughts on those comments? Well, so that's a, one very interesting thing that I think the market misunderstand. People think that model training is a one-time thing and then it's like, okay, you're done, you've trained the model, moving on to inference. Model training is actually an ongoing process. So the new information you're getting from the inferencing you need to feed it back to the model and train the model and you need to constantly upgrade the models, right? So I think that goes back to the core of the misunderstanding of how this is not a one-time investment that needs to be made, but an ongoing thing where like you're running the applications, which gives you even more data to feed the models with. Okay, let's take a look at your portfolio. If we can, if we pull this data off your website, uh, NVIDIA's run-up has obviously made it your number one holding. AMD has bumped up as well in the leaderboard. Marvell in semis. You've also taken on exposure, more exposure to cybersecurity with Zscaler, Sentinel One, and of course, CrowdStrike and some other enterprise software names that we've talked about before, like Snowflake. Confluent, I think, is relatively new for you, as are Shopify and HubSpot. So it was interesting to see them on there. We already talked about NVIDIA, and we have some survey data later that we plotted many of these names, so let's keep this at a high level for now if we can. The right-hand side of this graphic is a, a bit dated, but it still shows your general approach in terms of sectors that you like. So how are you thinking about your portfolio mix? And then we can get into some of the specific names in more details. Yeah, absolutely. So we still see upside in hardware, so we still have a large position in the names that you, uh, in the companies that you mentioned. We do as well have a very large exposure to cybersecurity. What's been happening this year, as we went in towards the end of last year, people decided to take a lot more risk and they gravitated towards this higher uh, valuation software stocks that ran up significantly into year end. However, what we've seen this year is a pretty significant pullback. So when we're looking for new opportunities, it's really the software side where uh, we're finding a lot going on, especially post this earnings season when you had like many stocks just, just, just get completely destroyed uh, on earnings. So even though from high level perspective, it seems like the Nasdaq is near its highs, um, the indices are near, near highs. If you look under the foot, actually a lot of stocks have really sold off from the peak, it all goes back to interest rates. People are nervous now about the Fed and when they're, they're exactly going to cut. And usually these sort of run-ups in interest rates create very good entry points for technology. So while we still like hardware, I think that's a still great place to, uh, to have allocation to going into 2025. There are a lot of idiosyncratic opportunities here post uh, some of these earnings, uh, uh, earnings hits that we've seen. Great, thank you. I want to also ask you about the AI effect and how you think about that. Here's a graphic from our, our partners at ETR that shows net score, which is a measure of spending momentum within a sector um, on the vertical axis and the presence in the survey, pervasion, if you will, uh, on the horizontal axis. This is 1,700 enterprise IT decision makers. And so again, you've got that spending momentum. That's the net percent of customers in the survey spending more in a sector. So a couple points, and then I want to get your thoughts. The first point is that the AI momentum was showing signs of deceleration right after we exited COVID, but then it's taken over as the number one position on the vertical axis since the announcement of ChatGPT. And now our data shows that 44% of customers say their Gen AI initiatives are being funded by stealing from other budget buckets. So in watching this data over time, 
many, if not most of the other sectors have, have been contracting on, on that Y axis. And that red line at 40%, by the way, indicates extremely elevated momentum. And there's one more data point that we can discuss and I wanna get your thoughts on this. This next graphic shows the LLM innovators, which are private companies, only private companies. We've superimposed where our data suggests Meta's Llama would, would fall on the spectrum, you know, the open source effect. And this shows intent to engage on the vertical axis, we call it net sentiment, and then mind share on the horizontal axis. And what you see in the upper right, it's so far off the charts, we had to highlight it as open AI. It's literally off the charts and has created a very wide gap between itself and the rest of the LLM pack. So Vana, you have this situation where enterprises are spending on AI experiments. They're stealing from other budgets to do so. Microsoft and OpenAI have taken the mindshare mantle and they have incredible momentum and the rest of the world is catching up. So how do you play this? You're famous for doing deep research into the value chain. So help us understand how the AI momentum fits into your investment thesis and how the companies you track and like are leveraging AI. How, how do you play this? Well, I think your data is spot on with what we're seeing in earnings that they're getting reported right now. There is a lot of excitement in AI, but not a lot of it is showing up just yet in the numbers. And the reason why it's showing up is that, as you said, basically there is spending on AI, but it's getting offset by cuts in other, uh, in other spaces. So the overall spending that will come to a vendor may not look significantly higher than what it would have been without AI and a stable or accelerating macro environment. But the important thing to keep in mind for investors is that we are still in a very tough macro, right? So if you're seeing companies still being able to grow 30 plus percent, even though that may be a little lower than what you would have expected, those are still very solid numbers in light of the current macro. So. AI is showing up a little bit. It's basically adding a few hundred basis points that are maybe now getting offset by what's been taken out by, by macro. But if you're a long-term investor and can step back, you are going to see as AI accelerates, you're going to see it show up, uh, show up in the numbers. We've seen investors kind of like going all in on the hype, but then once the numbers come through, not, not many pa patient investors are there to stick around and see the, see the benefits. I mean, you're right about the macro. Our data suggests that well, last year, IT spending grew about 3.4%. Uh, IT decision makers uh, came into this year expecting a 4.3% increase for 2024, but it's all backloaded. It's all second half. Q1 and Q2 were below that mean, and we're just getting in the April data now, so we'll be reporting on that, but there's no question it's still a tough macro. All right, let's look at some of the companies that you own and, and or used to own and see what the survey data says about them. This chart from ETR, like the one we showed earlier, plots net score, which again is spending momentum on the vertical axis and penetration into the data set on the, on the X axis. And we plotted a lot of the names that you own and some you've trimmed like Coupa and Cloudflare. And we've also put in some other names like Meta's Llama, Intel and SAP, just to balance out the chart and give it context. And we purposefully left off the hyperscalers, even though they're buying a lot of NVIDIA GPUs because they're so dominant and they tend to skew the data. So a couple of things. First, many of the companies that you own are above that or near that 40% mark. So that's, you know, you own some firms with a lot of momentum from a customer perspective. But let's start with the enterprise software players. You know, Snowflake, I want to talk about Snowflake. Um, you know, Frank Slootman uh, stepped down. He's now just the chairman. We saw this with ServiceNow. I don't know how closely you were tracking them several years ago. I thought at the time, I thought Jim Cramer was going to cry when Frank Slootman stepped down from ServiceNow. I think the same thing is happening here. But Mike Scarpelli, the CFO, is still uh, there. He committed to three more years. He has really run the operations. Uh, Sridhar Ramaswamy obviously has AI chops from Google. Have you talked to the company? How do you feel about Snowflake? Well, the original announcement when uh, Frank stepped down was a pretty big surprise to the market. And that's why you saw the stock being hit so hard. However, if you step back and you look at Snowflake's execution, they have been very slow in coming up with new products to the market. So if you look at the numbers, we would have expected the numbers to positively inflect last quarter, but for sure this quarter. And you really didn't see that 
uh, you really didn't see that show up in numbers. And now they're guiding to a little over 20% growth, which is not really uh, all that great for a company with this type of positioning in the market, especially with what's going on with, uh, with AI and all the products that they've been talking about. So I just attended a customer event yesterday for Snowflake, which was very interesting. The products that they have been introducing to the market, like Cortex, they talked about um, about it yesterday, uh, and they did a demo of how easy it is to use. They're actually super interesting. We're just in this period of time where there is not enough demand because of these cloud optimizations to offset what's new coming from this these new products that they're announcing, which haven't reached critical scale. But we're still very positive on the company because as you look into second half, you will start seeing contribution from this new product announcement. So we're actually, I like after walking uh, out of that customer event yesterday, I came out uh, pretty positive. It will take some time for it to work itself through uh, and get use of these use cases, but I still, uh, still really, like, uh, really like Snowflake. Okay, great. And of course, the street has to get comfortable with the new CEO and see some track record there. Um, how about Confluent? Absolutely. There is, yeah, yeah, there please, is a lot more Connor. risk. I would say there is a lot more risk to the story than what it was last year where it was like, okay, it's just a cyclical downturn. You are going to see some sort of a bounce. Now we're here. We haven't seen the cyclical bounce. So they are going to need to do something that it's kind of beyond what the market will deliver and deliver on their own product introductions. You know, I, I, this is nuanced, but I, I'll share this with you in terms of the conversations we've had with Snowflake customers is, you know, everybody's always chirping about Snowflake price. And when a, when a company, you know, you hear that about some of the great companies, ServiceNow, Oracle, uh, but what we have heard is that some customers are doing a lot of the engineering, the data pipelining work outside of Snowflake, because it's maybe more cost-effective, remember, Snowflake, as you well know, essentially resells Amazon infrastructure. And so that's a big part of their revenue. Uh, and so, you know, they got to they gotta keep that up. They have to sort of mark that up, if you will, uh, to, to maintain their margins. Now they negotiate really strong deals with Amazon and they pass those savings on to customers, but that's a tricky balancing act that Scarpelli has to play. He can't, he can't cut prices too aggressively because he's relying on that margin. And so, that's something that we're watching closely. Has, has that come up in any of the conversations? I mean, if you look at their products, they will actually save money compared to what you can build in-house. So I'm not as worried about that part of the story. I mean, just going to this uh, demo yesterday, it almost seems that like I can make and build some of these products that they were demoing, right? So it would be like using LLMs to do sentiment analysis that would pull from either your data or PDFs and they can even like, you can use the machine learning tools to forecast call volume or whatever you wanna you wanna forecast. So I think the products themselves add a ton of value. And I don't think it's something that you can, as a customer replicate as a significantly, at a significantly cheaper cost. I think it's more a matter of proving these use cases, showing them to people and just kind of hand holding them uh, through the process uh, to do it on the platform rather than in-house. But I don't think cost is the problem. I think it's literally just learning about these this new tools and, and products and how they can be helpful. Yeah, so it's adoption. I mean, there's a lot of data in Snowflake, the, 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 the phrase bring the AI to the data, so they're in a good position from that standpoint. Okay, I want to talk about Confluent. I mean, here you're betting on real-time streaming. It's built on top of, of open source Kafka. The stock has been kind of up and down, but what's your angle there, Ivana? Why do you like why do, you, why do you like Confluent? Well, the stock really fell out of favor two quarters ago when they reported uh, basically two customers left the, the platform and then people started getting all worried about that. And then they said, oh, well, one of the customers is, is actually moving from the cloud back to on-premise, on which was like, oh my God, like maybe this is happening across the board. Uh, so it, digging into the details, we did not find uh, the customer loss that significant. I think the stock was down over 40% that day. So it ended up being a very attractive entry point, uh, entry point for us. And as we've learned more about the company, data streaming could be as big market as data at rest. 
So this is something that it's a little bit more under the radar than data at rest and a little bit less understood. But basically, this could be a pretty significant market. And what they've done recently with this Flink acquisition is basically able to do um, real-time data processing. So um, I think a lot of the investors, even like on the on the analyst call, um, on the earnings call, they didn't quite understand what this company does and how this Flink will benefit it. So I think digging one layer deeper and understanding the size of the opportunity can really cause make a pretty big big differentiation here here in the stock price. So I think it's going to be a pretty significant data streaming will be pretty significant opportunity. I think what they do uh, is basically able to lower your cost or lower the cost to the customers to do this. Uh, makes a ton of sense, especially the time where people are looking at ROIs and and cutting down costs. So, um, so I think this company will do pretty well. Again, similar to Snowflake, they have had some execution hiccups, so they will need to prove out their business model um, and step up the gr their growth from currently the twenties to thirty percent. So, as these companies, and it's it, it basically it's interesting how. Snowflake came out, it was a one-off. Confluent came out, it was a one-off where like growth is slowing. But then if you look, you kind of see a pattern across the board where I think a lot of it is under the hood driven by tougher macro, right? So when you see the macro stabilize, I think a lot of these companies will be able to reaccelerate growth, which is not really common for uh, this part, like in their life cycle. Right, and and you know, they're, they're kind of a... Um... They're not a direct AI play per se, uh, uh, but but they they they're going to benefit them in a way. They're more vitamins than they are sort of painkiller, and so that maybe takes some time. Okay, now um, just moving on. You trimmed uh, Coupa, and you know picked up uh, Shopify and HubSpot. That was kind of interesting. What do you, what do you see there, and why do you like those guys? No, we found we found Shopify and and uh, and uh, HubSpot, HubSpot for for a while. Yeah, we've owned those two, and and Coupa basically we we exited a long time ago, um, even prior to the to the deal as part of a risk management, like when things were uh, were selling off. So I think for for HubSpot and Shopify, they're going to be pretty significant beneficiary beneficiaries of AI, as they own just a ton of customer data, right? So we're still at the early innings where we don't exactly know how they're going to be able to use this data and, and what they're going to be doing with it, but they will basically benefit. They will be able to introduce tools that they can sell to their customers where the customers can use the data um, and be able to, to come up with predictive, uh, uh, predictive things. So like HubSpot, I'm currently a user of it as well. And basically what, what it, what it can do like in the future, is if AI can somehow help predict who are the customers that you should be calling on, right? That would be a pretty significant time saving um, for the users. And similar, similarly, Shopify just deals like sees a ton of commerce data, right? So they're kind of at the forefront of innovation. So they are going to be able to use this to develop tools that will leverage this data. All right, let's talk about uh, cybersecurity. Maybe we could start with CrowdStrike. I, I feel like you can't own enough of that platform play. Zscaler, Zscaler was a bit of a head scratcher to me and they beat and raised and then the stock got got hit pretty hard. I guess it's because it's kind of backloaded, but I'd like your thoughts on that. Uh, Sentinel One, very strong earnings, but maybe weaker than than Hope Guide. Uh, so it's, the Sentinel One's like a much cheaper version of CrowdStrike. So interested in in why you like like those, and and it looks like you trimmed Cloudflare. Uh, so interested in your thoughts on cybersecurity. Yeah. So honestly, going into this year, I think cybersecurity is going to be a pretty significant theme, and the fact that these stocks have sold off so uh, aggressively post this earnings season is creating some very attractive entry points. Basically, what's been going on is. The companies are coming out in terms of earnings pretty close to what they guided, but they're not really beating by significant amounts. And the street, I don't know if it's because expectations got a little bit ahead of themselves in December, or is it the fact that interest rates are creeping up and that's pretty a pretty big headwind. 
But basically when they report, there is zero valuation support. So any small miss or comment really gets sold off. So I think uh, CrowdStrike obviously was probably the strongest report out of the three, but the stock is a lot more expensive than Sentinel-1. I thought the Sentinel-1 report was very strong yeah. uh, as well. The company could have guided a little bit higher than than what they did, but again, it's a tough macro, and uh, and some of their new products are still kind of at a point where they haven't reached like scale yet. They did say that today cloud and data is about 30% of their booking, so that's pretty significant, and that's growing at 60, 70, 80% growth rate. So I think all three look very attractive, and yeah, this scaler, to your point, People didn't like that the guide was uh, was really implying a very strong uh, fourth quarter, but the company was pretty confident on the call saying that they are seeing larger deals and they are seeing improved momentum. So if I had to say like out of the um, out of the enterprise space, especially post this sell-off here after Q1, a lot of this uh, this companies look very attractive and then, Cloudflare is just more of a, it, we still really love it. I just spoke to them um, this morning. I think they have some really nice momentum on the zero trust side and uh, and also on their workers and R2 uh, platforms. Um, it was more a matter of valuation and, and the stock is a little bit uh, more expensive than, uh, than the rest, but we would look to enter any, basically any of these pullbacks, I think are, are very attractive uh, entry points for this space because as soon as you see interest rates stabilize or the narrative change back to cutting, I think to, to cutting rates, I think you're going to see these names hit new highs. You know, it was interesting, of course, uh, Nikesh Aurora from Palo Alto Network set off sort of this chain reaction when he said, when he used the term spending fatigue. So, of course, all the cyber stocks got hit, but we heard from Jay Chaudhry and Zscaler, they're not having that problem. And certainly, clearly, CrowdStrike's not having that problem. So, there's CrowdStrike for sure is, is, is playing out that platform uh, scenario. So obviously, you know, executing very, very well. And of course, you own AMD, uh, which we show on this chart. Uh, we don't really have data, uh, spending data on NVIDIA. Uh, we talked about how you're thinking about that, but just broadly on the semi-trade, let me make sure I understand this. You feel like uh, this still has a ways to go. I think you feel like NVIDIA really has a moat with CUDA and the lead that they have uh, in, in GPUs and their packaging. Uh, et cetera. Uh, do you have any concerns there? So basically for NVIDIA, the concern would be as we reach uh, further into the cycle, you are going to see the numbers closer reflect reality, which I, I think we're still a few years away from, from it now. What I would say though for NVIDIA specifically is that you can even own this stock through the next cycle because the data center side is going to be significantly less volatile than the traditional gaming side. Because data center is not sold through the channel, um, a lot of these GPUs are sold directly to customers. When you see pullbacks or if there is a digestion period, you're going to see a one-for-one -one impact. What's been historically very cyclical for semis is when you see impact on demand, you almost see a double whammy from the channel, right? Because people are then going through a period of destocking. So I think what you're going to see with NVIDIA specifically, it's a lot more durable um, and less cyclical cycles going forward. So I think we're comfortable owning it um, in the next two or three years because of the cycle, but then forward even through a cycle, right? Maybe not at the current size, that we currently have it, but I think you can comfortably hold something like this through um, through a cycle. And AMD is actually, interestingly, if you look at their numbers, they're closer to the bottom than the top, right? So client is, uh, is really gone through a down cycle and it's just stabilizing and embedded is another segment that they have. These are chips that are embedded into industrial products uh, that actually went through an up cycle and now it's kind of bottoming out. So that's why if you look at valuation, AMD will screen a little more expensive. And the idea is that that's because the numbers are actually at a bottom. So I think even though it may not be obvious just by looking at the stock prices, 
I think we're really closer to the bottom here than than the peak in uh, in the semis. Great, thank you. All right, let's wrap with maybe some final thoughts, and we'll get your Ivana your your take on the market. You know, going forward, you know, Fed watching obviously, as you mentioned, still very important for tech stocks. Uh, because if I get 5% parking my money, you know, that sucks investments away from high risk stocks. But as I pointed out in my post comparing the AI wave to the dot com boom, interest rates back then, they were 7 8%, and tech stocks did just fine for, for a while anyway. Look, the market seems to be trying to go higher. It's just sort of shrugged off, sort of hotter than expected inflation data, and earnings continue to be a major driver. Seems like company CFOs are being conservative with guidance, so there may be some upside to earnings, although. Visibility still remains a bit a bit murky, um, and the AI bet is that it's going to lift all boats and drive economic growth and productivity. You know, we'll see if that kicks in this year. But Ivana, the market has been very hot. It's run up nicely since your premise, you know, last summer. So, you know, how do you play it from here? Maybe you could could summarize and we can wrap. Yeah, absolutely. So on the software side, as we talked about, it's a pretty significant pullback. So I think for investors that can take a slightly longer term, and I'm not, not talking about a 10 uh, year view, right? I'm talking about six to 12 month view, just to see this down cycle play out. I think software, we're finding a ton of opportunities. As you said, people are just overly focused on interest rates, but interest rates on their own don't really have a negative effect on the technology sector. So what you're seeing is a lot of times when there is volatility in rates, it creates this volatility in the stock prices and not the fundamentals, right? So they do end up being very attractive entry points. So I do think right now, even though the cycle, even though like the indices uh, seem like they're at their highs, it is actually a pretty attractive entry point for investors that can take a little bit uh, longer view. And to your point, I think second half comps are going to get very easy just because of how tough fourth quarter was last year. So fourth quarter, as a reminder, now it seems like it was in a distant past, but rates hit 5%. Things came almost to a full stop from the economy perspective. And a lot of the earnings that you're seeing reported today or over the past few months really reflect like, that reality that is now a little dated. So I think comps will get significantly easier and gu the guides don't seem very aggressive at all. So I think it's actually like, if you step back, I think it's a very good time to, uh, to look uh, back at the tech, tech sector. You know, Ivan, I love having you on because you're a fund manager with real conviction and you do a lot of your own research. You go deep and we really appreciate that. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you. All right, that's it for now. I want to thank Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production. Alex also does our, our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media. And Rob Hoth is our editor-in-chief over at Silicon Angle. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast wherever you listen. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You can DM me at dvellante on Twitter or comment on our LinkedIn posts. And do check out etr.ai. They've got great survey data. They continue to expand their, their data set. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.